International News Now. So now we want to talk about the recent developments in the North Korean nuclear saga. The United States and North it's Korea, a saga have, it is a saga. Um, extended crisis. Having, uh, the two sides, the United States and North Korea, have ex engaged in a tense standoff over this issue in the last year. Um, President Obama, in the transition, and his team warned the Trump administration. They said, this is going to be the biggest issue on your agenda. Um, this is the one that we expect to play the largest role in your national security strategy. Um, so what's happened over the last year since Trump has come into office? Trump has issued a series of threats, and North Korea has issued its own threats, and at the same time successfully tested nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of reaching the continental United States. Um, tensions have lesson somewhat since the Winter Olympics in South Korea. The North Korean regime accepted an invitation from the South Korean government to send an official delegation to the Olympics, which they did. And then there were two additional significant developments last month. The two governments of North and South Korea formally announced that their leaders will meet for formal talks this week, beginning on April 27th. This will be the first such high-level meetings between the North and the South officially since 2007. And on March 8th, in a joint press conference with the South Korean National Security Advisor, President Trump announced that he had agreed to meet the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, in a summit between the two countries. First time ever. First time ever. So that's big. Uh, um, over the past week, North Korea, last Friday, in fact, North Korea announced a halt to additional missile and nuclear tests. So what do these developments for the security situation mean for the peninsula? Could North Korea and South Korea agree to a formal peace treaty that officially ends the Korean War, which was fought from 1950 to 1953. And just to be clear, there was never a formal peace settlement to that war. Yeah, um, from a ceasefire, 19 basically. Yeah, a ceasefire, right. that, so they are officially still in a state of war. Um, might they get a new peace treaty? Might the North Korean regime give up its nuclear program in exchange for significant American concessions that could include the withdrawal of American troops from the Korean Peninsula or the end of the alliance between the United States and South Korea? These are some of the questions that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and, what we, and part of the background here, we're running a little bit of time, so we're going to skip the overview clip and then just give you a little bit more of the background, and then we're gonna move into another clip that talks about denuclearization. Um, so we know first, right, North Korea has suspended its missile tests and its nuclear tests. And this, well, we're gonna see that this is debatable how significant of concession it was by the North Korean government. President Trump, in his tweet last Friday, said that this was, a, this was huge, this was significant. He equated this with denuclearization. Um, and so, it appears like progress. Um, it's a political win for the Trump administration. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, interestingly, I think, and as we mentioned earlier, President Trump has tried to reduce some of the expectations last week, um, suggesting, right, yes, I agreed to having talks, but if we don't make progress, I'm willing to walk away from these things. Um, we should also talk a little bit about why we have this breakthrough, why the change in North Korean diplomacy over the past few months. And there's at least three sets of possibilities here. Um, one is that what's really driving this is South Korea. There's a new president in South Korea that has um, staked his career on a peaceful diplomatic solution. He helped set the conditions for the initial breakthrough with the initial invitation at the Olympics. And so this is really about, one argument is this is South Korea driving the process right. and pushing, pushing forward because they don't want to get caught up in a larger war um, between the United States and North Korea. The second is this could be President Trump. Right. Right, and it's his threat of war um, he talks about, right, if you remember the fire and fury comment, um, the threats that were given to North Korea, that these threats have pushed Kim to the bargaining table. Um, and I think something to realize here, to, and there's been research on this, and this is a credit to President Trump, is that it's oftentimes easier for hardliners, people that stake hawkish positions in military affairs that repeatedly threaten war and threaten military strikes, 
it's easier for them to get a deal because when they make concessions, it's not costly to them domestically because right. the domestic audience doesn't doubt their bona fides about being a hardliner, right? right. So they say, if Trump is, if Trump makes concessions here, well, we know that he's going to be tough on other issues right. like Iran. He's and this already got the credibility. Mm -hmm. And this is this was the argument made about um, President Nixon when he opened up China, right? Is that he had a history of anti-communism, and so it was only he was the only person who could open up that kind of tie to a communist China because of his long history of anti-communism. He wasn't going to be tarred by his opponents as being soft on communism. The same could be applied here with the rhetoric that Trump has used against North Korea is that people aren't thinking that he's getting taken advantage of. And this, we could also think about this in terms of the links between Iran and North Korea. This might also be a reason to be tough on Iran because the audience isn't just Iran and it's not just Macron, it's also Kim Jong-un. And so when right. he says that the Iranian, when he calls the regime butchers and he said the, the deal was horrible, it was a joke, that's also a signal um, to North Korea as well. The third thing to realize is that North Korea is now negotiating from a position of strength. It's easier to make concessions for them. Why? Because they've got nuclear weapons and long-range missiles right. that are capable of striking the United States. That's what's brought, what they might believe, that's what's brought the United States to the negotiating right. table because we now have a viable threat to impose unacceptable costs Which on mean North we Korea. meaning North Korea, right? right? And so and along these lines, it's relatively costless to impose a temporary halt or ban. This is, pub this is a public relations stunt because I can restart this program anytime that I want. I've already demonstrated that these things work. Well, most of the commentators argue that that's exactly what President Kim said to his domestic audience, is that we are entering into these negotiations as a nuclear power. We have nuclear weapons. And so the, some of the analysis that I've read is that he's trying to establish these talks as if they are the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union originally launched nuclear weapons talks to limit the nuclear weapons, they came in as established nuclear powers. And if North Korea can do the same, then the talk isn't about not being a nuclear power, but just about managing and controlling it. And that's, that's their position of strength, is that they have nuclear weapons. And that's the key division between North Korea and Iran, yeah. right? Iran does not yeah. have it. Um, and well, and then the, the comparison is made also that well, never. I'm going to hold on this for later. Let's move to the let's move to the uh, the next clip, talking about one of the primary hurdles in these negotiations is going to be to define exactly what denuclearization is. So let's go ahead and run that PBS clip. To help make sense of North Korea's statements and motivations in the upcoming summits, we turn to Jean Lee, director of the Korea program at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. She was also the former bureau chief for the Associated Press in Pyongyang. So let's first start talking a little bit about the definitions here. There seems to be a different definition of denuclearization for the United States versus North Korea. What do they mean by it? For them, they've been talking about denuclearization for a long time, and they mean denuclearization of the entire Korean Peninsula, not just them giving up their nuclear weapons, but the United States also removing its nuclear umbrella over the South Korean region as well as Northeast Asia. So they're not necessarily saying that they are going to stop all of their nuclear programs. It's just specific to the nuclear test site and the missiles at this point. Exactly. And we need to remember that even though this is such a dramatic statement, the North Koreans have said this before. It's not the first time they've agreed to suspend nuclear weapons and ballistic missile testing. Just a reminder, it was only six years ago that the North Koreans agreed with the United States to place a moratorium on this type of testing in exchange for significant aid and concessions. Mm -hmm. And then just a few weeks later, test launched a long-range rocket. Uh, and so that certainly, that deal fell apart. So it's not new. It may seem dramatic, but longtime North Korea watchers will tell you that we've heard this before. Well, how does this factor into North Korea's long-term plan? What we're seeing right now is really strategic messaging on the part of the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, to his own people. What we saw with the news that came out of North Korea 
just the past day was a significant moment in the making of this North Korean leader. This is going to be a treatise that is going to go down in history in, in North Korea. And he's telling his people, listen, we are done with this phase of nuclear testing for now, because I have done what I set out to accomplish, which was to prove to you that I can defend you with nuclear weapons that are proven to be a global threat. And that means that makes us untouchable. So he's telling his people, not only are we untouchable because we've reached this point with our nuclear weapons program, but also that it makes us a world power. And we see that in the language in that treatise. It also positions him to sit down with the leaders of South Korea and the United States in a very different position than had he done this years ago. Uh, he is trying to portray himself as a rational world leader who embraces the concept of a nuclear weapons-free world. And so he'll win simply by sitting down at that table, even if he gets nothing out of it. What are the costs for North Korea to continue a nuclear program? I mean, this is a very poor country. And this is partly why he's telling his people, look, I know that we've sacrificed a lot by pouring our meager resources into this extremely costly nuclear weapons program that has taken quite a toll economically, not only in terms of the cost, but in terms of sanctions as well. The North Koreans have been living with sanctions for decades, but they've certainly been stepped up. The elites of Pyongyang know that sanctions are going to start to take a significant bite mm -hmm. in their economy and their way of life. And so that's something that he's telling his people as well. I did this as an investment in our defense, and now I can step back from that and refocus those resources into the economy. All right. Gene Lee of the Wilson Center joining us from Washington. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. So just want to emphasize a couple things from this clip. The first is, and this is why we asked you these poll questions at the beginning, um, and your responses to the poll questions reflected this distinction, that the two sides have very different views of denuclearization. Remember that Trump tweet that we showed you at the beginning of class? Says, well, North, it basically said that North Korea is already denuclearized by stopping tests of both missiles and nuclear weapons. Um, huge win for everyone. Um, this journalist suggests, well, North Korea has a very different idea of denuclearization. They think of it not about them giving up their nuclear weapons, but denuclearization of the entire peninsula. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we're going to give up our nuclear weapons, that means that you have to remove the nuclear umbrella that's protecting South Korea. Right. Now, that is equivalent then, basically, to the United States of withdrawing from the alliance pact with South Korea. Right. That's not going to happen. Right. Um, so, but the and, and realize what the security umbrella is. It includes some anti-ballistic missiles yeah. as well. And that's, that would be really controversial. Yeah. Right. Um, so very different definitions of denuclearization. These things are going to have to get negotiated. But I think one of the reasons that we, I mean, you're, like I said, your poll results demonstrated that the sides have very different beliefs about what this means. And the significant point is that they're, they're going into the agreement with huge differences, right? right. Um, and one of the things that we're going to see in an upcoming clip is how central the possession of nuclear weapons are to the stability of the North Korean regime of Kim Jong-un, right. right? This is essential to survival. One of the things that I was going to say earlier is you know, the lesson of Libya, the lesson of Iraq is right. if you don't have nuclear weapons, you get invaded, you get toppled. If you have nuclear weapons, you don't get invaded. And so the possession of these things are central to regime survival. And so that means that constructing a deal with the United States where North Korea makes concessions would mean the U.S. doing something to essentially solidify or strengthen or preserve Kim's regime. Right. Um, and f one last thing we just want to point out of this clip is the domestic benefits that Kim right. receives from meeting with the U.S. and from this program. All right, so now to talk more about these domestic benefits, we're going to run a clip, an interview with Bob Corker on ABC from Sunday. Joining us this morning, the president struck a more optimistic note in a tweet on Friday after that announcement from Kim Jong-un about freezing nuclear tests, suspending them, closing a major test site. The president saying, this is very good news for North Korea and the world. Big progress. Look forward to our summit. You share that optimism? 
Look, I'm glad they're meeting. I think all of us look at this with great caution and skepticism that's been going on for 25 years. And obviously, uh, Kim Jong-un has learned about public relations and is setting it up well for him. But I think everyone uh, that's been around this uh, looks at this uh, It's just the beginning. Uh, it may lead to something, may not. Um, let's make sure the meeting and the context for it is all set up in the appropriate manner. But, let's dig uh, into what we'll that, have to see. Yeah, let's dig into what that means, because a lot of people have pointed out that the concessions that Kim Jong-un has made are pretty easily reversible. He's made them before. That's right and that it's going to set up the expectation for concessions from President Trump. So is this, a, is this a, a danger? You know, some people talk about a freeze trap here, referring to that nuclear freeze, that President Trump gives too much to get the meeting. Yeah, I think, uh, I think people are well aware of exactly what you're saying. I don't see us giving any giving up anything. I hope we will not. We'll con the, the, the policy right now is continue to put pressure on until something happens that's productive. But this can be easily reversed. Um, he obviously, as I've mentioned, has learned a lot about public relations. But, uh, you know, I, I think the president has people around him. You look at John Bolton, a, a great skeptic uh, who will uh, warn of any uh, easing that might be considered. Is it realistic to think that Kim Jong-un is actually going to give up his nuclear weapons. You know, George, you know this. He views having deliverable nuclear weapons as his ticket to dying as an old man in his bed. He saw what happened with Gaddafi. Uh, Gaddafi's a dead man now because he gave up his nuclear weapons. And so um, to think that somebody's going to go in and charm him out of that uh, is not realistic. Is there some progress that can be made? I hope so. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, that's a big hurdle. So, so lay, lay that out then there. What is the best case for, one, this summit if it happens, and two, longer-term negotiations with the North? Well, of course, best case is denuclearization, I mean, obviously. Um, is it realistic that he's just willy-nilly going to do that? Absolutely not. Um, but, you know, progress can be made, um, freezing the program. Uh, who knows what his, what his ambitions are as it relates to South Korea. Um, but look, I think we go into this knowing we've got a huge problem. He's gone way down the road with his nuclear activity, uh, very close to having something that's of danger to the United States. And I think uh, beginning discussions, we should hope for the biggest. Okay, a couple of yeah. points here. First, be skeptical about the, uh, right. the chances for a breakthrough in this agreement. And that's what- well, If breakthrough means getting rid of nuclear weapons yeah. in North Korea, yeah. right. Um, you know, it could be that the two sides construct a deal where, I mean, he talks about the public relations skills of Kim. It could be that the two sides construct a deal that looks great initially, but doesn't really mean huge subs um, substantive concessions on either party. Right. Um, but this is very much in the early stages. Um, second, note what Corker talks about at the centrality of nuclear weapons to regime survival and how significant they are to uh, to Kim in North Korea. And this reinforces points we've already been discussing. It's going to be very difficult for the United States to talk him into giving them up. He probably won't do it unless the United States can offer some set of terms that strengthen Kim at home. But the, there'd be huge domestic challenges associated with the gov right. government of the United States doing something, right. taking a series of steps that right. essentially guarantee his survival in office. Well, and there's a commitment problem. Yeah on both sides, right? Yeah. And so why would Kim yeah. believe well, a, a guarantee that yeah. would last, you know, into the future past Donald Trump? Yeah, exactly, right? So even if President Trump says, we're not gonna invade North Korea during my term, right. why, why might not, how does he bind future presidents to do that when he's not in office? He can't. He can't. Right. And so he, here's the question I want you to think about is, is there a less is there something short of denuclearization in the sense of giving up nuclear weapons that would be satisfactory to the United States? Mm -hmm. And there would be a gain and a significant uh, progress to just stop North Korea's nuclear program right here, right now, as it is. And that is where I'd say there could be some negotiation. And whether, you know, that comes through is, is yeah. going to be the big question. And again, again, what that hinges on, what's the politically acceptable definition of denuclearization exactly. in the United States for the American public? And Because Trump could call that a win. Yeah. 
You could call uh, that a win. Yep. I mean, it's not what a lot of people have in mind. It's a risky win if they back away from it in a year. Right. right.